Hi friends. I actually don't know if this is starting as soon as it says it is. I'm hoping that it is, but I am going to start over just in case. Hi everyone. My name is Luciano Gonzalez. Welcome to Luciano's Logic. This is our weekly live stream. What we're going to be talking about, talking about today is creating peaceful communities. And before we did that, I wanted to take some time to use the platform I've built to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart just for a second. Today is the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, and that is a really important topic to me. That's a topic I feel very strongly about. I do support the legalization of prostitution. I also support its regulation. I am hoping to have a live stream about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is a topic that I've tweeted about. If you follow me on Twitter, you can go and check out those tweets. Another topic that I am going to briefly talk about is the fact that I went to a private school. I went to a Christian private school. It was not the best thing for me, sexual. So hearing the ways that they talked about LGBT people, including asexuals at the school I went to, was definitely damaging to me. And I am going to be having another live stream about that in the near future, probably in the next two to three weeks. Um, although I will probably have more than one conversation slash live stream about that specific topic, because it's a topic that a lot of people are very interested in, including lots of people who have solid audiences who would also be interested in hearing about that. So I think it's possible that I'm going to organize more than one live stream about that specific topic over the course of the next three to seven weeks probably one before the new year and then maybe one or two after. So that way different people with different experiences can come on and can talk about it because this is a thing that I care a whole lot about. And it's a thing that people were interested in hearing more about when I had a conversation with Lily Cuervo yesterday. If you haven't seen that conversation, I highly recommend you go and check it out. Lily and I talk about a whole bunch of really neat stuff. We talk about our experiences in religion. We talk about the communities that we were raised in. And we also talk about the ways that like we were raised and bits and pieces of our deconversion stories. I highly recommend it. I am going to start having those sorts of individual live streams slash chats pretty regularly next year. I want to have considerably more live streams next year, especially now that I am starting to have them more and more often and I'm starting to be able to get a grasp of my schedule. That being said, now we are going to dive right into today's topic. Today's topic is creating peaceful communities. And this is a really important topic. I want to figure out how to help your community specifically, as well as communities in general, become more peaceful. And by this, I'm not talking about a negative peace, wherein there is just no active conflicts, there are no people who are mad at each other, and everyone's sort of bland and polite. I'm talking about positively peaceful communities wherein people are not afraid of conflict and conflict can be resolved and transformed productively and peacefully. If you are interested in this sort of topic, I hope you'll stick around. I hope that we'll have a very productive chat and that I can learn about the communities that you think of when you think of your communities, whether it is your place of employment, it is where you go to school, it's your families, or it's your actual community that you physically live in. Community means different things to different people, and I want to be respectful for that. So I have different sections in mind in this particular conversation. This episode is not going to be a one-off. We are going to revisit this in the future, and it's entirely possible when I start my eventual podcast, like my personal podcast where I talk about peace and conflict studies and communication studies, I am going to revisit this specifically there as well, but I'm also going to do this in different live streams. If you guys have different ideas for communities that you'd like to hear my thoughts about and that you'd like to have either a private conversation with me about or you'd like to see me talk about publicly like this or maybe as part of a panel where there are multiple different people who are parts of that community as well as myself having conversations about the sorts of issues that the community is going through and the ways that that community can be worked with and can be improved and made more peaceful, I would love to do that. This is a real conversation that I'm hoping to have, although I know that like this probably feels, at the very least, the beginning of these live streams often feel like I'm talking at you and not to you. And there's value to that as well. But I am hoping that we can have and we can eventually create real conversations 
that are going on in our communities and that we can have real conversations on Monday nights, just like we're doing right now. So when I say that I am talking about a positively peaceful community, I'm talking about a community that's capable of tackling difficult topics with respect, with compassion, and effectively. A community that's not afraid of conflicts, but is willing to speak truth to power and is willing to advocate for justice. Creating peaceful communities is not creating bland communities where people are afraid to say something out of fear that it will hurt someone's feelings, but rather a community that is willing to have difficult conversations and where people know that they're going to make mistakes, but what matters is that their intentions were in the right place and also that they accept it when they are corrected. These are difficult things to teach people. These are difficult things to create in communities, but there are things that we all can do. I want people and the communities that they're part of to be capable of talking about difficult topics like religion, justice, politics, and all sorts of other things like that, because these are important conversations. These are important things that affect people, whether or not the community is willing to admit when there is an imbalance or when there is an injustice going on. And the first question that we need to think of is if we already have a specific community in mind, is our community or are our communities willing to tackle difficult topics? And I'm not saying that these events, the ways that these things are being tackled have to be perfect. I'm merely saying, are they willing to at least try? Because trying is the start of something. And if people are willing to try to have these sorts of conversations, to learn about these things in good faith, that's already a really healthy community that is willing to do what it takes to become better and to fight for its members. That's really important because a community that is not peaceful is not willing to fight for its members. It's not willing to be, it's not, sorry, I need to adjust my seat. It's not willing to be confrontational in the right way. It's something that is important because if you are a member of a marginalized community, whether you're someone who is not white, boy, I hope that my live stream is still working because I see that it is buffering right now. I do not know if it's still working on your end. Please let me know because, oh, Sorry for that little interruption, but a community that is willing to have these sorts of conversations. It's a community that's capable of having your back. It's a community that's capable of rallying around you in a positive and meaningful way. And that is something that's really important. This community doesn't have to be as big as the town you live in or the place you work. It can be as small as your family or your immediate circle of friends. And I am happy to be here having this conversation with you all because step is asking yourself if the communities that are in your minds are willing to tackle these topics. I'm going to take a step back and say that if the communities that you are a part of are not willing to tackle these topics, then odds are there are people in the communities who are willing to do so but are afraid. They're afraid of the social rejection or the social stigmas that might come with being willing to talk about these things and the isolation that could come as a consequence of it. If you know members of your community that are willing to have these conversations or that want opportunities to have these conversations, then that's where you can start if your community is not willing to have these conversations itself. Because having these conversations is an important step towards becoming a peaceful community. Because in having these conversations, you can see what it's like when your community has conflicts and you can see where it is that your community's conflict response needs work and where it is that you can step in as a leader, as an activist, and as an organizer. And the reality is that you all are leaders, activists, and organizers. And I'm not just saying this because you're members of my community. I'm saying this because you're social beings in a social world. We're all social beings in a social world. If we are online, if we're making videos, if we're watching videos, we are engaging in social activities. And that's important. It's important to recognize that for what it is. If we are willing to do the work needed to have peaceful conversations, to have respectful conversations, and to be cognizant of the fact that people can respectfully disagree, and that in and of itself is a sign that your community is peaceful or that your community is inching towards peacefulness. Those are all great things. So if your community is afraid to tackle difficult topics, there are small ways that you can participate in changing that. 
you <coughs> can, uh, sorry, I needed to cough for a second. You can send videos to your friends where people talk about difficult topics. You can organize trainings if you are talking about your place of work. You can start conversations if you are a leader or an organizer in your community that is recognized by other members of your community. You can host trainings if it's in a place like a work setting or in a school setting. And also, if you are talking just about your family, you can have conversations with them. And if you're worried that you are a member of a marginalized group that they might not know, say you're someone who's in the LGBT community, there are simple ways you can see how it is that they're going to react to if you decide to reveal that you are a member of this marginalized community. One thing that you can do that is something that I know a lot of people is you can have a conversation about a hypothetical member of this community who wants to be a part of the community and is a member of the marginalized identity. To illustrate this, um, something that I know a lot of LGBT Let's Next folks is something that they do, something that we do when we are worried about coming out to our families, is that we have conversations with our family members about hypothetical people in our communities who are LGBT and who came out to us and told us this important secret. We can see how it is that they react. If they're reacting in positive ways. Like they're just like, oh, I hope that this person is doing well. I hope that this person has a support base. Then you can start to gradually see that maybe, or they can start to gradually see that maybe the reactions that they'll get from their friends and family are not as negative as they feared. Now, this isn't always going to be a picture perfect or a mirror reflection of what's actually going to happen, but it could definitely be one. And it's worth doing, it's worth trying out. It's important that people be brave enough to try these things out themselves because there are people in your community. Your community is more than, say, six or seven people. I can almost guarantee you that there are people who want to have real conversations about pressing social and political issues, people who want to have conversations and learn about these topics who are afraid to start. And it's important that someone out there is willing to be ambitious, is willing to be brave, and is willing to risk what the fallout could be in order to have these conversations. Because communities are not, if a community is unwilling to be in a real conflict, if a community is unwilling to disagree with members, then that community is not a tight community. That is not a community that's stable, that's not a community that's going to be able to rally around someone if something bad happens to someone. And that's dangerous because communities are important. Communities, whether you're thinking of your workplace, your family life, your school life, or your actual geographical location, matter. And they're important social nexuses. They're important social relationships to be a part of. And it matters that they be willing to be peaceful, that they be willing to learn and work together and learn from each other. Because every community has experts in things. Every community has people who are doing hard work, who are doing valuable work. And they need to be able to learn from those people. They need to be willing to platform those people and to be like, hey, we might not always agree on everything, but we recognize the expertise you bring to the table. We recognize the validity of the work that you're doing, and we want to learn from you. So as I said before, there is value in trying things even if they fail, because if you start conversations, then that means that other people can see what happens and they can learn even if you fail. People can learn from the events that did happen, even if you had an ambitious plan where not every single thing happened. And people can learn from the sorts of organizing that you did. They can see what mistakes were made, whether it was from you or from someone else, and they can use that knowledge to help plan better events and to help plan more important future events and other topics and other topic areas. That's talking about, I would say, probably more geographical communities. If we're going to be talking about work, something that we can do, and I'm gonna come back to geographical locations because there are other things that I wanna to touch on when we start to near the end of this. But if we're talking about places like work, then the sorts of organizing that needs to get done is different and the sorts of social hierarchies and social relationships that are going to factor into successful organizing and successful, peaceful community building are very different. Because then there are people who are directly in charge of you and people who have direct influence, not only over you, but also over your livelihood. And these are things that people need to be cognizant of. And it's 
valid to be afraid of messing up in those sorts of situations. That's a logical fear. Unfortunately, it's a fear that oftentimes needs to be worked through. And I wish that I could give people better advice on doing that. But the reality is that oftentimes in those situations, if people understand the importance of building peaceful communities and building positive relationships, then they're just going to have to be willing to take a risk. And that is deeply unfortunate. By the way, if you guys can't hear me, let me know at any point. So I got a new microphone. It apparently worked solidly yesterday in the two live streams I was a part of. But if at any point it starts to sort of fizzle out, let me know. I, I'm definitely reading the comments. I'm active. I'm looking at stuff. I got this. But if you want to do that sort of training, then there are different things that you need to keep in mind. And there's different relationships you have to factor in. There are things like people who are above you and people who are below you, people that you have power over and your coworkers. You have to think of whether or not they're going to be able or willing to attend things like training and roundtable discussions. But also you have access to more resources if you're thinking about things in a work context, because oftentimes there's funding, especially if you're in, say, a corporate environment. There is oftentimes funding for training, for opportunities like this, and for event building. And also, this is something that looks good on your resume. Even if it's something that you failed, it's something that you tried, and it's something that you gained experience doing, you can leverage it, and you can gain experience from it that will benefit you in your career. That's one of the real pragmatic reasons why it is that people should be willing to try these sorts of things out. And the same could be said for community organizing. If you are thinking of your specific geographical community, like the town you live in or the county you're a part of. Because then you can also be like, yeah, I was a member of this community organization and we did this work for this reason. And that's experience that I gained that can assist me professionally. That's something that's really important. That's something that's really valid. I want people to remember that even though it's easy to be scared of this sort of work and it's reasonable in a lot of contexts, there are pragmatic reasons for you to be doing it that are beyond being woke or being socially active and being someone who's seeking justice. You can leverage the sort of experience you can gain into things that directly benefit you. And that's something that sounds a little bit materialistic, but if it's something that organizes people, if it's something that motivates people, then it's okay to use it and it's okay to encourage people to participate in all sorts of new events and new trainings because of it. By the way, I'm really sorry for the kind of horrendous quality on my webcam. I'm thinking of buying a new webcam in the near future, a separate one that is higher quality. I'm going to be putting that in my Amazon wish list, which I'm hoping to finish tomorrow night before Wonder Lady and I's live stream on Wednesday. I had to think of the days of the week for a second there. Now, I'm going to shift slightly onto families. Part of the reason I'm going over this so quickly is that this is one of the so-called foundational conversations. This isn't something that's supposed to be ultra specific. This isn't something that's supposed to address like hyper specific issues. Although in the future, I am going to do that. And I actually am taking notes on some of the stuff the Wonder Lady said and some of the stuff you other guys have been saying too, because I want to be able to address these things in productive ways in the future. So if you have suggestions of topics that are affecting your community that you would like experience and advice in and that you want to have a real conversation about, please let me know. Additionally, I said there's going to be no after party. There might not be, but if you guys actually feel like having one and if people want to participate in one, I can definitely do one. I thought I wasn't going to be able to, but it turns out there was a change in my schedule, so I am able to do one. I was able to get more work done today. And I initially thought it was very exciting. I was I was nervous for a bunch of different reasons. So yeah, if you guys want to do an after party, we can. But if we're changing things up and we're going to school environments, there's actually a really specific thing I want to highlight right now that is part of the reason why it is I love this specific topic so much. Over in Dadesville, Dadeville, Missouri, there is a high school named Dadeville High School. And students at that high school actually organize a night to celebrate and highlight survivors of domestic and dating violence. And part of the reason I think that this is so important is that the school recognized the leadership of the students. And to me, that's incredible. They allowed the students to take 
uh, I'm not and not necessarily like community-based events, a basketball game, and turn it into something genuinely positive. In the notes that I'm going to publish later on, uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a link in the specific document that lets people read about this actual night. But I highlighted it in a couple of the social media platforms that I use because I think it's really amazing that the school recognized the legitimacy and the leadership of the students. And that's something right there that creates a more peaceful community because they recognize that though dating violence is a very heavy topic, they saw that students were willing to lead and they gave those students the power and authority to do so. And that's an example of a peaceful community that is willing to tackle difficult things. And that's something that lots of different schools can learn from. I'm very happy to be able to highlight an event like that. And I hope that people who are in that community see that event for the truly wonderful thing that it is, because it's a school recognizing that the kids are a lot more than all rights, and that the kids are not just the leaders of tomorrow, the kids are actually the leaders of today, and they're leading right now in small ways, and they're gaining experience. That's the sort of event that I want to highlight, that I want to help people and organize. Also, hey Christy, how's it going? I hope you're having a great night and I'm really glad you could be joining us. So that's the sort of thing that peaceful community leaders and that justice-oriented individuals create when they're given opportunities to do so. And the reality is that sort of event wasn't just people who were in positions of power organizing. They saw that students were already willing to do something like this and they gave them the reins to do so. That event is truly wholesome. And I'm happy that it happened tonight of all nights when we are having this sort of conversation about building peaceful communities. If we're thinking of an even smaller scale and we're just thinking of our families, then the work takes on a very different and oftentimes vastly more personal context. But also this means that organizing is a lot easier if you're thinking of your immediate family, say, your mom and dad and or your siblings or the people who raised you, whatever relationship, whether it's biological or just social, they happen to have with you, then it's a lot more personal and it's a lot more intimate. And it's about building cultures and relationships of trust. And that's something that's very difficult because it's very easy for people to lose trust or for them to show that they're not worthy of trust. And for someone to show that they deserve trust is something that takes a lot of effort. It's something that takes conscious recognition and it's something that takes respecting everyone involved, whether you are someone in a position of authority over someone like someone's parents or someone's older sibling, or you're someone who has less power and less authority socially. But thank you, Christy. I'm glad even if you can only stay for a few, you'll definitely come back. And I'm happy that you could spend even a few minutes with us. Building healthy relationships with your families and with your family members is something that's difficult. And it's something that takes effort. And oftentimes it takes making mistakes as well, because it's in making mistakes and this is when conflicts emerge that the most trust can be built and that trust can be shown to be stable. Because even if you disagree with someone, even if you get into a conflict with someone, if you're willing to listen to them, if you're willing to give them the respect that they deserve, if you are willing to work with them, then you can definitely learn from what they're saying. And that can show them that you are someone who deserves to be trusted and respected. And that's not always going to be that dynamic. It's not always going to be that easy because lots of conflicts can feel deeply personal and can be deeply personal. So I understand why it is that the process of building communities that are peaceful, that are justice oriented, and that are hardworking is something that takes time and energy. But I'm happy to see that people are interested in having these sorts of conversations. If we do have an after party today, I would love to have conversations about specifics. We're almost at the end of my little lecture and we're going to get into the 15 minutes of just casual chat that we have at the end of each of these. But the last thing that I wanted to say, I wanted to go back into geographical communities for just two minutes and talk about specific things that people might not always be aware of. So if you are in a geographical community, and you're thinking of geographical communities when you think of community as a whole, which is something that makes a lot of sense. Odds are most of us, when we think of our community, we think of the specific place we live in. Then I want you to be aware that there are things that you can do 
that help you get involved in making peaceful communities and in making justice oriented communities. And these things are not as dynamic and as long term as getting elected to an elected office or to being a volunteer. There are things like international advisory committees in towns like Greensboro, North Carolina, where there are heavy immigrant populations and also there are people constantly going to and from the community from outside of the country. And that's something that's really important because that's something that gives people an opportunity to get involved with international people and to be a sort of policymaker without being elected in the conventional sense. Although in Greensboro's specific case, there are ways to get elected to the International Advisory Committee and there are specific seats that people can hold that give them power and authority. And that's something that I was aware of. It's something that I wanted to get involved in when I lived in Greensboro, but unfortunately I left before I could. And I'm hoping that if I ever go back, which I would like to, that I can get involved in that. Another example that people can get involved in are things like civilian oversight committees for law enforcement. So these are groups of civilians who oversee and get reports from law enforcement, and they help craft law enforcement policies and law enforcement responses to certain ongoing controversial or dynamic and evolving situations. And those are really important because those sorts of things are things that enable people to get involved and to also be a member of the community that has a lot of influence and has a lot of responsibility, but also gives people the ability to actually affect change. Another thing that people can do, hey, Congreen, but hope you're having a great night. I'm glad that you could be here or not night. I don't know. It's night where you're just making an assumption that everyone's US subject. But Another thing that people can get involved in are communities and organizations that are not directly members of like governing bodies or the legal processes that happen in your communities. And those are things like Toastmasters International, which are things that help people build skills. And that's something that's really important because Toastmasters International is a fantastic organization that helps people become better public speakers. It's something that I definitely could use more experience in, but it's also something that I am gaining in my own way by being over here and by having these sorts of conversations with y'all, especially since in the future, I'm hoping to make these conversations more than weekly, not necessarily about peace and conflict studies, but about different things, about like history and about the state of atheism and the state of atheistic discourse online, just all sorts of really fun stuff that I think is very interesting. Those are organizations that people can get involved in that enable them to be better peacemakers and that enable them to be better people who can help orient their communities in peaceful and productive ways. This has been a whole lot to talk about, but what I really want to do here is I want to help people get the courage needed to be leaders who make communities more peaceful and who work to create organizations and institutions that actually help resolve conflicts in traditional and in non-traditional ways that are positive and productive. And that was the end of my little 30 minute spiel. It was just under 30 minutes. That was the fun time where I get to have a bit more of a chat with y'all. I really hope that you guys enjoyed my little lecture this week. I know that it was a lot more vague than this, but the main purpose of this isn't to pretend that I have the ability to give people the skills, but rather to give people stuff to think about and, and to encourage people to socialize in more positive and productive ways, as well as just being more confident in your own ability to be peacemakers, to be activists that pursue justice, to be people who are positive and productive members of your societies, and in your communities in ways that are beyond just having a job and paying taxes and voting in some cases. I have a lot of really active community members and I'm really excited to be building this community in the way that I'm building it. I, I'm sorry, Conquering, but you got here just in time for us to be having a real conversation. But also, this is the interactive section of this where you guys just say, anything that's on your mind, you guys think of like specific examples of stuff, and I have a real conversation with y'all. Also, there is the possibility that today we could have an after party. Um, I think we might not have an after party tonight, and we might instead have like a group live stream tomorrow. I think that that might actually be a better thing 
and we could have it from like 8 30 to say 9 30. I think that would be fun. And I also think that would be a different way of doing this because that would give people time to think about what we're talking about. And also it mean that like Mondays through Wednesdays, I'm active on YouTube every single day, which would be nice. If people want to do tomorrow, that's definitely a thing we can do. I do think that would give us time to have like specific things you want to talk about. And also any group chat, any chat that has more than one person is not going to be super focused. So that would give us an opportunity to just sort of talk about whatever. I think that that would be an interesting way for me to do live streams, especially because like, I feel like my live streams are definitely kind of quirky. <laughs> I think that, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I like the live streams the way that I do them, whether I do an after party or not, because I think that like the sort of content that I create is definitely more oriented towards educational stuff. I, I always want to be more high energy and stuff, but I'm worried that like, given the audience I've created, people would be weirded out if I started being animated. I promise I can be. And if you guys have seen me in live streams with other people, you guys have definitely seen me animated and like participating fully in the conversation. But on my own channel, the audience that I'm building distinctly, it's definitely an interesting look whenever I am like more active and animated in my videos. And it's something that I don't know if it's like a thing I like or not, although I do want to do more animated stuff in videos. So that might be a thing that I try to incorporate into my next couple of videos. I have videos coming out later this week, not today, not tomorrow. So today and tomorrow would probably be good days for live streams. And I actually think that's a thing. I do think that's what we're going to do. I think that instead of having an after party today, we'll have a sort of casual chat tomorrow where we just talk about whatever. And we definitely can talk about like peace and conflict studies. Um, but this is a good way for me to like actually be friends with people in my community instead of having like this weird parasocial dynamic that most YouTubers have, especially like the really big YouTubers who don't know their audience members. I, I, that's not a thing I want to have, which is part of the reason I kind of like my bigger, or I kind of like my smaller audience because I can actually get to know you guys. I can like know you by name. I can know what you're up to. I can have like real friendships with you all instead of being like, Hey, I'm going to make a video and you guys are going to watch it. You guys are, gonna like it or not like it depending on the quality of the content I create and I'm just gonna benefit from the video like this enables me to actually learn about people and hear where people are coming from especially because in my field like I feel like a lot of people who study peace and conflict studies and who act as peace and conflict studies in some way or another are actually better at like being friends with non-academics and having healthy relationships with the community, like with the country as a whole, because like there are definitely different fields, like in history, where there is sort of disconnect and there's a sort of distance between academics and people like not in academia. And that's something that's part of the reason I like peace and conflict studies. That's a big reason, actually, because I like being able to apply my field of study in ways that intuitively make sense to other people and that give people opportunities to get involved in the sort of work that I'm doing. And I feel like at the very least, the sort of history that I was studying and the sort of history I was doing work in when I was an undergrad was not like that. Although that's not the case for all historians. But yeah, I hope that you guys have been having a great day so far. I hope that you guys had a wonderful just sort of morning. I know that my morning was very busy. I, I've been having a lot of fun at my internship and I've been like learning a whole lot. I've been getting more social. Tomorrow, there's going to be this thing called uh, hashtag log out Facebook. And what that is, is it's a protest against Facebook, because Facebook has a history of, uh, I'm sort of going on my little platform now, if you guys want me to talk about anything else, let me know. But I'm participating in this. So I'm not gonna be making any Facebook posts tomorrow. But log out Facebook is a protest that's being organized by, as far as I know, the NAACP. And what it is, is a response to Facebook's really complex and really frustrating history of data hacks and selling the data of people of color, especially African-American people. And it was organized in response to the most recent discoveries concerning the Russian campaign to influence the 2016 election. And 
let's see. I'm reading, I'm reading Conquering Thoughts Tana, which is the reason I stopped that in Wilson. How do you get and well I meant that literally the most in the same language? I feel like that's a really important thing to sort of think about. I, I think it's sort of, I think it's an important thing to sort of work towards as well. Not necessarily the speaking the same language in the most literal sense, but the sort of language that people think of when they think of people's ability to understand themselves. Give me one second, you guys. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to mute my microphone and I'll be right back. Oh, that was unfortunate. Ha, I love it when I don't mute my microphone. This is actually the second time that that's happened in the live stream. So that's neat. You guys, like one of the nice things about my channel is that if it ever gets really big, people will be able to look back and see me just be a complete dumbass online. This is not even the first time. This is the first time on one of my live streams that this has happened. But this is not the first time on another person's live stream. I think it was on um, Black Sofa Vlogs live stream back before we had the podcast. Um, it was during one of the Star Wars live streams where I thought I muted my microphone, but I did not mute my microphone. I thought I turned off my camera, but I actually turned it on and I was gone for a good 40 minutes and you can see my room. I'm a really good YouTuber, you guys, I promise. And I'm being completely sarcastic. I hope that this is something that's endearing to people and it's not something that's like really embarrassing to other people like it is to me. But also I really like like this, like people can tell that I'm not a part of a production company because I have zero production quality. And I also have very little professionalism in live streams. High quality content brought to you by me. <laughs> I am going to end this live stream at like 8.45, but that's mostly because I need to go and get some dinner. We are going to do a live stream tomorrow. It's going to be a really casual chat. It's, it's just going to be opportunities for people to have conversations if they want to have conversations and for people to talk about like what it is, if anything, that you guys have learned in my live streams and also like ways for people to be like, hey, here's a sort of feedback that I think would help you improve the quality of your live streams. And that's really important for me because believe it or not, I'm actually super nervous in my live stream. I, I do, I'm not a huge fan of solo live streams, although I think they're fun in their own way, but it's like really nerve wracking to just sort of sit in front of a camera and talk to yourself. And that's something that's not the funnest thing in the world. And it's difficult for someone who's not used to talking for a hugely extended period of time to just sort of talk at something and hope that people are watching and leave comments. That way the conversation isn't just someone ranting to themselves. Yeah, this is some real talk right now brought to you by Luciano's logic. I have a whole lot of fun with these sorts of live streams. I learn a lot as well. And it's something that I think is gonna be really important for me and my career in the future. I actually think that what I'm doing right now is helping me become a better professional and a better public speaker. I'm definitely losing the nerves that I feel like. I feel like a very different person compared to three weeks ago, which was when I did my first solo live stream in over two years. Like it was in, I think it was in 2015 when I did my last solo live stream. And you can actually check my channel. Like if you go back far enough, like all the way to the beginning, you can find solo live streams that I did back when I had literally zero subscribers that I used as the way to upload videos. I wrote out like a little script and I talked about it and I didn't do a very good job. Like I don't do a very good job of sticking to my notes right now, but mostly I feel like I should probably start just bullet pointing them and stuff, like writing out paragraphs because it makes it look like a really badly written script. But <laughs> It's a lot of fun for me. It's it's a learning opportunity. And this is something that I really appreciate because I have an audience that is willing to watch me make these sorts of silly mistakes and is willing to just sort of have fun with me and hopefully learn stuff from the content that I create. 
Like there are people who are very charismatic and they can create very entertaining content. For a bunch of different reasons, I don't feel like I'm one of those people. So what I do instead is I create content that I hope entertains, but mostly tries to educate people. I try to talk about topics in a way that I think makes sense. And in a way, sorry, my headphones keep slipping out. These, these earbud type headphones are like really bad, you guys. I know there are people who like them, but in my case, I think it's because I have really weird ears. They always just sort of come out really frustrating. But yeah, um, live stream tomorrow, probably from 8.30 to maybe 10. Um, I'm going to have a poll up that's going to, um, I think it's too late for me to be able to get like really good results on that since usually it's best for those to be up for 24 hours. But I'm going to have a poll up where people can vote on Twitter after I eat dinner. Hey, Duke, you missed a really embarrassing moment. And unfortunately, we're about to leave. You missed me just like, you missed me almost certainly the audible as I, as I yelled at my family. Not like in an aggressive way, but just in a way where it's like, hey, I'm upstairs and they're downstairs. I need to be loud so they can hear me. But I got called to dinner and I had to tell, to tell my family to give me a second. Which is very fun. Because I was 90% certain I muted my microphone. I came back and it was not mute. So good at this YouTube thing, you guys. I like you guys a whole lot. Very glad that we can have this sort of community. I hope that you guys are having a wonderful day. If not, you guys know that you can always message me. I'm going to start having my Discord link up again, especially since my audience has kind of grown. Not explosively, but I've gained a good 50 or 60 subscribers since the last time I had my Discord link in my videos. And also, I'm getting close to 250, which is my big goal for the, for New Year's. So if you guys like my channel, if you guys want to help me hit 250, just share my channel with folks and tell people that I'm just a quirky graduate student who's doing his best at creating internet content. And his best is not very good, but you can tell there's a whole lot of heart in what he does. I hope that's how people look at my content anyway. That's that's how I look at my content. I'm sitting at 238 folks right now. My goal is 250. That's less than one subscriber a day. And that's a lot for someone with an audience as small as mine. But because me and Wonder Lady have been working our butts off and getting my content in a whole bunch of new places, I've gained new subscribers pretty much every single day, most of this month, actually. And I've also gotten well over a thousand views on my last, I'm going to say 15 videos put together. Many of my last 15 videos have gotten over a hundred views, including some of my like live streams, which really surprised me. And also Wonder Lady's channel is growing and we need to help her grow as well because Wonder Lady is like my YouTube partner. She's like my YouTube best friend. We're constantly plugging each other's contents, which is a thing. It's another great sentence to take out of context. Um, there are apparently a lot of this. It's a really magical thing over here at Luciano and Wonder Lady Incorporated. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really appreciate when people like tweet out the sort of stuff that I make and when people tweet out like the videos and just like acknowledge me in shout outs. It's something that's very nice. It's very wholesome. I appreciate it. And whenever my pals are getting close to like major goals, I always do my best to plug their content because I know that one day, maybe I'll reach uh, a big goal of maybe 500 subscribers. If I could hit 500 subscribers, that would be like, I'm not going to say that would be life changing, but that would be honestly amazing to because that's so many people who decide that like I'm someone that they like and at the very least someone that they learn from. So if they like the sort of stuff that I'm creating, they want to be part of the community that I'm building. And to me, the subscribers that I have are a part of the community that I'm building. I know that sounds like a really cheesy thing to say, but I'm not, I'm not going to say that people are like my family, although I do refer to my friends especially the people who constantly view my content and whose contents I constantly view as like the fan squad. But I mostly do that because it's a reference to Jack's films. And I feel like if I ever become a big YouTuber, that would be like the, that'd be like the fan base name, the fan squad. 
or the logical people, the, I don't know, the logical crowd, since Luciano's logic. That was actually, like, probably one of the smartest things I ever did, changing my channel name from, like, Luciano Gonzalez to Luciano's Logic. And I did it because of a friend of mine who actually watches my live streams, um, someone who I chat with, like, in real life, um, someone who's a member of the Psycho Latino Alliance, recommended that, like, I rebrand my style and I rebrand my content after seeing, like, my, not my asexuality video, but one of the videos like that. And he was like, hey, you should change the channel's name to something like Luciano's Logic. And I was like, you know what? That's really catchy. I'm going to go with it. I hope you guys have a very wonderful night. I enjoyed this chat so much. We are going to live stream tomorrow. I'm going to put up a poll on my channel. Um, not on my channel. I don't have the community tab yet. I'm going to put up a poll on the Twitters. And I will let you guys pick specifically what time we start whether it is 8, 8.30, or 9. I'm not going to start at 9.30. I feel like that'd be very late because I get up early. I get up like to say I'm going to work. Um, but 8.30 will be the late, or 9 will be the latest. And it'll be about an hour. And we can have a chat. If anyone's available, let me know. I'll send you the message. We'll hang out. So we'll probably have like five people. And this might be this might be a thing that we do from now on because I feel like this might be a better style, especially since Anna and I are doing our podcasts on Thursday nights, which was the change that was a very different change of plans. So yeah, I will see you guys around. I absolutely loved our chat today. And I hope that tomorrow we can have an even more wonderful chat. Until then, I'll see you guys around.